of introducing the one, the only, Gloria Steinem. And when we hear Gloria's name, we think of feminist, we think of journalist, commentator, uh, public figure, uh, philanthropist, uh, uh, d defender of all sorts of issues. And when I was asked to, s to introduce Gloria at 11 o'clock this morning, um, <laughs> what I immediately thought was rock star. So I get to introduce Gloria Steinem, the rock star. Come on up. Um, I could go on and on and on and on and on about the wonderful things that Gloria has done. And in fact, probably at 3 a.m., the CFW staff was working away at providing those uh, tidbits. Uh, but I think that if there is anybody in this room that doesn't know who Gloria Steinem is, see me. And I will be happy, I will be happy to tell you, uh, because I have a four-page gig about it. But Gloria is um, just an amazing person and an amazing, amazing friend of the Chicago Foundation for Women that she would jump on a plane this morning, get here, knowing that she has to turn around and get back this afternoon. So I'm gonna stop my talking and say, Welcome, Gloria. Thank you so much. I, I know how much Maya wishes that she were with you, and I know how nervous I am to be substituting for Maya. <laughs> If you've ever heard her speak, you know how extraordinary an experience that is. And she not only speaks, she sings. She usually sings at the end of her speech. You'll be happy to know. <laughs> <laughs> and here I am, a Midwesterner, uh, which sort of in my <laughs> experience meant you had to be on LSD to know whether we were angry or happy. <laughs> So <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to do my best, <laughs> OK? But I hope very much that you will let Maya know all this wonderful, moving information, examples, personal stories that I've heard here today. It is such, such an enormous gift to be here in a room with 2,000 of the greatest hearts and minds in, in America is truly, truly a gift. And it's true that I'm going off to Zambia on, <laughs> on Saturday morning. Uh, and it, it has a kind of symmetry I, I wouldn't have anticipated, because there are meetings about sex trafficking there, for, for women there in Zambia and from other countries. Um, and of course, that is a poor area. It's a supply area, right? And I'm so proud that you have this morning had an extraordinary conference about the demand side, to use economic terms. And I will tell them that. It is so, so, so important. I don't know the figures there, but in India, for instance, 25% of the sex tourists are from this country. It is very much something that rich countries do to poor countries. And I will tell them about your meeting this morning, and I know it will mean a very great deal to them. Um, I hope you know from what you've heard today that the women's funding movement is the center of the most rapidly expanding funding movement, and it's expanding even in this economy. I believe it is the only part of the funding movement that is expanding in this economy. It's supporting women and girls who are the country's most underused resource and in the world at large, the most underused source of, of leadership. But I want to assure the, the men here, all of whom are honorary women from this. <laughs> <laughs> and whose very presence here today will keep you safe in the upcoming revolution. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
I want to assure you that it was only Freud who thought biology was destiny. <laughs> the women's movement is much smarter, okay? <laughs> we know that it's about getting out from under the gender roles that turn us into the leaders and the led, the subject and the object, the paid workers, and the homemaker who is called a woman who doesn't work though actually homemakers work longer and harder for less pay than any class of worker in the United States. I always wonder, too, if it isn't with more likelihood of being replaced by a younger worker. I don't know that there's a... St <laughs> <laughs> Into people who have one job and those who have two jobs, one inside the home and one outside the home into the perpetrators of 90% of the violence and the recipients of most of the violence, and in short, into the family model, the deepest earlier model of human differential at birth, which is then followed by race, by class, and all the other birth-based differences to come. There is a direct line from the democracy or lack of democracy in the family to the democracy or lack of democracy in society at large, and including our attitudes towards violence in our foreign policy. One predicts the other. Now, it's very clear to me, however, that it is just a role that men can change. And if you'll forgive me, my example has to do, I suppose, with my age, which is that uh, in my generation, men could not type. How many people remember that? There, there, was, there was a whole, you know, they, they absolutely couldn't type. I was afraid to go into a magazine office. Somebody would hand me something and say, type this. Um, the, it, it had to do with uh, fine motor skills, fingers. So <laughs> I mean, it was really, really, really proven that men couldn't type. And then computers came along, and voila, suddenly men could type. <laughs> So it's clear to me that the change can happen, and it's also clear to me that the masculine role punishes men too. It literally shortens men's lives. We tried to figure out once in a Ms. editorial meeting exactly how much that shortening was, and so we backed out of the death statistics for men all of the causes of death that could reasonably be attributed to the masculine role, deaths from violence, from speeding, gun deaths, tension-related diseases, and so on. And we figured out that men would live at least four years longer if they weren't being killed by the masculine role. So I just want to tell you, men in the room, that this movement has four more years of life to give you. What else can make that offer? <laughs>